Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Daisa West, and I'm the Chief Impact Officer here at the Denver Foundation. And on behalf of the whole foundation, I'd like to welcome you to Leading and Learning, an event for TDF fund holders focused on education. We're really delighted to have you here with us today. Just a few housekeeping items um, before we get started. Um, as you all can see, the session is being recorded. Um, we do have closed captioning or subtitles available um, in this meeting. If you'd like to use closed captioning, just click on the button at the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen and select show subtitles. Um, you can also choose to show the full transcript. Um, you'll all be muted for the presentation, um, but we really encourage you to ask lots of questions um, and use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we we want to hear from you for sure. Um, and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can in the time that's allotted. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to pause um, and uh, introduce my colleague, um, our president and CEO, Javier Alberto Soto, um, and invite him to say a few words. Thanks so much, Desa, and thank you all for joining us this morning. If you're here, you clearly care a lot about education, and we're not surprised to see the interest in this topic because every year we see many of our fund holders and partners support work going on in the education space. Our donor advised fund holders, in particular, year over year, um, oftentimes support education related causes above any other subject area um, that we fund here at the Denver Foundation. In fact, in 2020, there were over $18.5 million granted out of donor advised funds at the Denver Foundation to education-related organizations. When we started on the path to building a new strategic framework, education also bubbled up in our community outreach sessions as an issue and topic that the community was telling us the Denver Foundation needs to pay close attention to and make a priority. It is something that has been a priority through our community grants program for many years, and that will continue in our new strategic framework. Specifically within the education sphere, our focus in the new strategic framework will be around racial equity in the K through 12 system, boosting student performance, as well as looking at and addressing issues with respect to school funding. We often look for opportunities to bring our fund holders together to meet with leaders in different areas. And certainly education is one that we wanted to convene um, as we launch our new strategic framework. We wanted to convene early on and promise to continue to host these sessions with leaders throughout the education community here in Metro Denver. Today, we're, we're thrilled to have a couple of those leaders who have joined us, and, and my deep thanks to Vernon Jones and to Riley Carter for joining us today. In a moment, Desa will introduce Vernon and Riley and, and get us started. So again, just uh, to thank you for joining us and for your deep commitment to this community and your partnership with the Desa Foundation, with the Denver Foundation. Desa, I just renamed us um, in your honor. I hope you appreciate that. So with that, let me turn it back over to Dinsa. I am delighted with the new name, Javier. Thank Thank you. Thank we'll you have to get that. our communications folks to work on the branding. <laughs> it's a new branded logo. It's going to be pretty amazing. So, um, so I would like to welcome our two guests, um, Riley and Vernon. And I'd like to start us off um, just by reading out their biographies. Um, I, they're both so impressive. Um, I want everybody to be fully grounded in just what amazing uh, panelists we have with us today. So I'll start with Riley. Um, she served as the Colorado Children Campaign's Government Affairs Director and Vice President of Education Initiatives. Uh, while she was there, her work focused on developing statewide political strategy and the creation and advancement of education policy. Most recently, she was President and CEO for Climb Higher Colorado, an education nonprofit focused on advancing research-based family school partnerships. Riley now provides consulting services to a mix of organizations and foundations in Colorado through RPC Consulting. Her work is guided by a commitment to advancing a more equitable system of public education. So welcome, Riley. Really happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Vernon Jones, Jr. 
leads the charge to abolish inequities, inequalities, and injustices that prevent children in Northeast Denver and beyond from receiving the excellent education that they deserve. He has previously served and led that same charge at Denver's Manual High School and the Omar D. Blair Charter School. He is Jamie's proud husband of 23 years, father of the fabulous five, Savannah, Nathan, Caleb, Lily, and Brooklyn. He's the son of a retired 30 plus year black DPS educator and leader, Miss Janet. And he serves on the leadership team of FaithBridge and in his faith community at Kinship. He's active on the boards of Colorado Humanities and Mentor Colorado. So welcome, Vernon. Happy to have you here. So let's dive in with some questions um, just to get us started in our, in our conversation with the three of us uh, this afternoon. You know, one of the pieces that came out strongly in the Denver Foundation's strategic framework was racial equity and a real commitment to centering racial equity in, in every piece um, of, of work that, that we do. And I know that that's important to both of you as well. Maybe I'll start with Riley and ask, you know, how does the movement to advance racial equity more generally intersect with education? Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's an honor to just spend some time with you all and to be here alongside Vernon, who uh, I know will have more uh, beautiful answers than I do. So I'm glad to go first. Um, but as I was thinking about this question, um, I was thinking about how oftentimes in education, we sort of pit things against each other. And, um, and, and there's finite, you know, capacity to dive in on different topics. And so I guess what I would say is um, the movement to advance racial equity should be woven throughout every single thing we're doing in education. It's not its own strand. It's not um, this thing that you do to the side, but it's every component, whether we're talking about school finance or accountability assessment, um, it is, there is race and the way that um, oppression and racism have shown up in our system is pervasive. And so I guess I would just urge, I'm pushing myself to think about it more broadly um, then like this is a component of our education work. Um, and I would ask all of you to join me in that and push me because I'm sure my own biases and limitations continue to um, get in the way of me fully realizing what that can look like. Thanks, Riley. Vernon, let's get your voice in this conversation. Same question to you. Yeah, thank you again for having us. Um, I think Riley that makes a great point. I think it is the work. Right, it's it's not a sliver. It's not a something a checkbox. Uh, I think it is the work. I think we are acknowledging that the system and structures have not um, been designed for the success of all people. Have not been set up for all people to thrive. And so the work is to right those wrongs. And so uh, um, it's across education. It's economics. It's the whole entire thing and so i think when we look at even philanthropy how does philanthropy give dollars to not just deal with the surface but how do we get at the root so that what we are doing is radically changing those things that have always been that no longer need to be and so um yeah it's 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 it is the work right it is the work and we have to be able to um, have the stamina for it. We've got to be able to have the courage for it. Um, and we, we have to know that it's going to put us in uncomfortable spaces. And when you're in that uncomfortable space, you're just starting, right? And so you have to get into that uncomfortable space and then begin to, to move in ways that help racial equity become the norm of, of our society. I love that piece, Vernon, that you were just describing about the kind of deep systemic root causes that be, that um, are addressed um, when you're using a racial equity framework. And you know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about you know just why that's so important um, to emphasize racial equity when we're talking about the specific challenges to education. Yeah, and I, I think that. Uh... Again, what, this is, I'm gonna give credit to my dad. And I hated it when I was a kid. He would make us go out and pull weeds uh, like every Saturday before we could ride our bikes. 
And he would tell us, me and my brother would often just pull off the tops. And then my dad would come out there and he would check the yard and he would say, you guys didn't pull the weeds. I'm like, dad, you can't even see them, right? He's like, the roots are still there. And as long as the roots are still there, the problem is still there. And so I think getting to the root of the issue helps us to eliminate the problem. We're seeing a lot of the manifestation of the root problem in, in, in the education gaps, opportunity gaps, the disparity in resources, right? All of those are fruits of a bad root, right? And so a lot of times what we'll do in philanthropy or anything, we'll just deal with its surface and make it look better and figure like, okay, it's gone. But then three years, five years out, it manifests itself again because we've not changed the root. And so um, I give credit to my dad on that. So we, uh, we got to get out there, pick our get, our, get the weeds pulled all the way to the root. So then we can have fun and ride our bikes. But um, I, I think that's, that's critical that we are, we are not just dealing with cosmetic answers. And that's what sadly we, we have done. Um, and we've allowed that to make us think, oh, Obama was elected, post-racial America, really, right? The, those, those, we got to get at the root. And, and uh, that's the only thing that's going to transform the education landscape is when we are courageously getting at the root um, of the problem. Riley, that idea of getting at the root makes me think about just, you know, the mindsets um, in the, you know, in the broader education universe and, and the community at large. So I wonder what you, what you think it might take to really drive a shift in mindset around racial equity in education. Yeah, I mean, these are all systems that are advanced by people um, and shifting mindsets is how you shift systems. And uh, I, I have to give credit to Vernon. He's in the middle of this work, uh, living it out day in and day out. And it's hard I mean, because this stuff is deeply personal um, and it is woven throughout the fabric of how we live and how we've grown up and who we are and our identities. And, and what can come across as you're doing mindset work is you're not doing the real work. You know, the, the day-to-day should I shift my practice in the classroom? Are we actually going to do assessments this spring? Those questions aren't getting answered, so to speak, when you are doing mindset work. Um, and so you have to do it in a way where people keep showing up. Um, and I know that I've done a ton of this work on my own and it's, you go through a process um, where there's embarrassment and there's hurt and there's frustration and resentment and you know all these things and and that's exhausting work and so i think it's essential that it's a part of the way that we think about our jobs um, as they relate to education and from a foundation it's a part of what you emphasize when you make grants and invest in things is to say if you're doing this project how am I also investing so you can do the mindset work? Because it's a part of it um, at the same time, it's not separate. And um, and I don't think that we often build space for that. And so we just hope that people are doing it on their own or that it's happening elsewhere. Um, and I'd say the majority of where I've dug in and done mindset related work is around family school partnership and just the way that we think about families. Um, and the biases that come forward, it doesn't matter if you're Dem or Republican, um, there's always agreement that families matter. And then comes the second statement on um, a set of beliefs about which parents don't truly care about their kids. And at the root of that is mindsets. Um, and I've yet to find a parent that doesn't care about their kids. Um, so I think it's about building that in to say, if we're investing in your work, we're also investing in mindset shifting. So tell me how that's going to show up and what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I definitely mindset. Um, I will tell you that the problem though, is it's like the, we call it the, with all deliberate speed, mindset of dominant culture, right? Things change as fast as dominant culture is comfortable or as fast as dominant culture's mindset changes. So when I talk about it with folks, I talk about head, heart and hands, right? So hands, what are you doing? There's some things that we know right now that are not equitable and we should just stop doing. 
there are things that we know about funding that are not equitable and we should just stop doing. We don't have to wait for our brain to catch up with it, right? We need to just stop doing those with, the, with we just need to, that's, we know, just stop. Maybe if you keep reading your books, keep doing all your book studies and all that kind of stuff, your brain will eventually kept, catch up. But there are some things that we have to right now with a sense of urgency, just stop doing, right? As, as we talked about the uh, grand jury indictments that came down for Elijah McClain, uh, 32 counts, they said, you have to stop doing chokeholds. You have to stop giving ketamine, right? It, they weren't waiting for people's mindsets to catch up. They knew at the root, those chokeholds and the ketamine, not good business, right? So I think that's where, we're, when I talk about getting to the uncomfortable space, there are some behaviors that we just have to stop. And as we get into the pattern of those behaviors no longer being the norm, those behaviors actually begin to change our hearts and to help with the mindset shift, right? I'm at, at a school and just walking around with kindergartners today. And when you have to redirect the kid from a bad behavior, you're not waiting for the kid's mindset to agree with you that it's a good behavior. You redirect the kid to say, okay, let's choose, let's, there's a new good behavior, right? And you hope that as you continue to redirect towards the good behavior, eventually, the mindset's going to change and the kid's going to say, okay, I know. So I, I think there's also that, like definitely agree with mindset work, but I think it's simultaneously your mindset, your head, your heart, and your hands. And you have to simultaneously do that work. Um, or, or, or we're just, we're just, again, Dr. King said in 1963, like um, we've, we've heard the word wait constantly. And usually what wait means is never. And so we have to own that as a culture and say, we have to stop saying wait and begin to say now. And that changes the game. Absolutely. So shifting gears just slightly, um, but really on the same theme, I think of inequity. Um, let's talk about COVID and how that's impacted um, the education system. Um, what are we seeing? What are we seeing in terms of disparities for, for, for youth? Um, what are we seeing as opportunities? Yeah, I'll, I'll say frontline, as Riley said, being on the front line every day in schools in my role as the ED of the Northeast Inner Innovation Zone. Whew, just today, let me just tell you, just today, um, kids are, we, we've had kids who are out of the building for like a year and a half, right? And they're in the building. This is kindergarten, first graders. Their first experience of school in the building as first graders, and they are at different emotional spaces and places than your traditional kindergarten, our first grader would be, because that first grader would have had kindergarten to help prepare them. And so you've got kids in first grade who didn't have kinder, who are coming in with social emotional needs. You have kids in third grade who were the last time they were in the building in the first grade, and they are totally different kids. And they, so there's a lot of, not just academic needs, but there are very much social emotional needs. There are very much um, needs for grace and space to kind of like process and to say, what did what, what we actually just go through or what are we still going through? And it's, it's, COVID has created this, created this like, we keep trying to force it because I think in Colorado and across the country, I think that at times we are, you know, we've got Western, that Western spirit that like, we're going to go, we're going to push. But I think what I'm watching and seeing from kids and from staff is we're going to have to slow down to go faster, right? We're going to have to slow down and really dive into wellness. We're going to have to really slow down and dive into uh, uh, managing the grief process that students, teachers, leaders are going through, um, because if we don't, I think we're setting ourselves up for um, some some real back end struggles when it comes to our uh, emotional well being and our and our just you know. So I, I think that right now, COVID is really exposing to us that we've got to take better care of one another. We've got to slow down to go fast. We've got to be listening um, to what students are saying, what they're feeling, what teachers are saying, what they're feeling. Um, you go from, and, I, and I'm not going to call anybody out, you go from, you know, working in pajama pants for a year and a half, right? And, and now you got to get dressed every day and you're going, you know, 
hard for, you know, you know, a teacher's work, you're going 13 hours a day. Um, and you just shift it like that without really processing um, your own wellness and the same thing with kids. So that's for me, it's like the big glaring thing that we need to deal with. We already had this problem pre-COVID, not enough social emotional supports within schools, but now I believe it's magnified because it's not just students who are in great need. You also have staff members, families who are in great need. And if we are not careful to care for this, I think we could be in, in a very rough spot. Riley, what are you seeing around COVID? And, and do you see any you know, particular opportunities for ongoing change, something that might you know, change for the better as a result of what we've seen in the COVID, COVID world? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I have, I have two thoughts on what needs to happen. Um, I'm sure many of you are reading the same articles that I am as the academic data is coming back and we're, we're seeing just the significant learning loss that's happened and impacts and things that our guts and hearts already tell, told us was happening, but there's some of that data too. And so the two things that I think about, one is the crass quote of don't waste a crisis. And I'm fairly anxious and, and if I'm totally honest, a little pessimistic in this, like this was, this was a pivotal moment where kids had to go um, online and there was virtual, there is a way to start thinking about the school day and the school experience differently. There is more access to technology than there's ever been. And there are ways to leverage that moment in time, but I think people are exhausted and scared and we didn't come to great conclusions on how to do all of that well, because it was, done in such a crisis moment, but I think it's a real waste. We're seeing the state come out and say, no to remote learning and things like that. And it's like, what are we learning? And how can we use this as a moment to say, what does it look like for school to be more adaptable to the needs of the children it's serving? Um, and I think continuing to push on that question is critical because the further it feels like we get from the pandemic, I know we're still very much in it, um, but the more that kids are consistently going back into schools, I think the further away that urgency will feel. And so raising that question up and to say, that all still happened. What did we learn? How is it still showing up? Um, that's one. The second thing is um, the effects of the pandemic are going to be very long lasting on kids. Um, I think both from an academic and a social emotional lens and the influx of funding and support and um, and being there for kids, it needs to persist over time. And I think foundations have a pivotal role to play in pushing the state and others to say, I know that the, you know, kids were out of school two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. What are we still doing? Because um, I was talking with a mom recently mon who's monolingual Spanish speaking and her child did kindergarten completely remote and she was in tears saying he's entering first grade and does not know how to read and did not get what he needed out of that experience and I am not an English speaker. I can't teach him how to read in English. I can do all I can do in Spanish and, and will support him there. Um, and through a program and a project I'm working on, we were able to get her tutoring and it's made a big difference, but that's, you know, we know the ripple effect of that. Um, and so I just would say like, making sure we don't have the American attention issues where we, you know, what's the next thing, but we consistently say that still happened and that change your trajectory of many children's lives. And we have to figure out how we keep our attention there. And simultaneous to Riley's point, looping back to the racial equity, that's been a lingering problem. That's been a lingering pandemic yeah. that we have yet to solve for, right? And so within the midst of this pandemic, let's, let's be careful because what's happening is that the kids who've already been failed are falling further behind because the system that they are in is designed 
for them to fail. So you put a pandemic on top of a system that is already designed for them to fail. And those kids and their families and their communities fall further back. And you think about the long-term effects of that work. So it, it's all hands on deck with the resources that we have, the, the, get, the talents that we have, the, the volunteer time that we have to say, how can I plug in? And maybe not in the school building because we're being very cautious because of uh, the variant, but how can I organize a tutoring session in my neighborhood, right? How can I organize a read along with, with families in, in my neighborhood? How can I connect with other pockets of people within my city to say, you guys, our kids need us. And we have to show up very differently than we have been showing up. And um, I think we can, I'm very optimistic about it, right? Very optimistic that we can do the things that Riley's talking about and, and come outside the box, come outside our silos and really honestly begin to think about the kids of our city. I really think we can do it. What are some of the, what are some of the specific solutions that are exciting you right now as, as you think about, as you think about being able to do it? What, what, what hits you as being really meaningful? I love, I love what Riley talked about. Like Riley's got some great things that she's working on and um, she can brag about those things, but it's also like, I work with, you know, folks who are doing small group tutoring, folks who are, you know, there's a, there's a lady that uh, in, in our shared office space in Park Hill, um, she's taken on herself to really, um, tutor kids and doing it at a reduced rate. Um, and she's got about 30 kids that she's helping to catch up. And she specifically is working with kids um, who are dyslexic, right? Um, understanding the challenges they do. So she's helping out. I see retired teachers, you know, plugging back in uh, to help out with things. Retired teachers, you know, going back into buildings to, to be supports to teachers um, who are also emotionally dealing with this, right? Um, I see, you know, um, on, on our campuses, like at Northfield, folks doing parent education uh, to help parents get up to speed on, hey, here's where we are. And, and we, wanna, we wanna present some things that, uh, some tools to you so you can reinforce these things at home. So thinking education in a, you know, three generational approach, right? We've got the student, we got the parent and maybe a grandparent. How do we put all of what we're doing in a package that it hits everybody so everybody can be about that? So I see a lot of folks thinking outside the box. I see kids, you know, pulling together their own, you know, catch up groups or kids doing their own like, you know, um, academic clubs, right? Which that wasn't a cool thing when I was, you know, we was, doing other things right but you know kids see this and they see the needs of their peers and these young scholars to older scholars it's their you know so it, there's a lot of great stuff going on in in pockets um and i just think that we can we can we can expand it and make sure all kids are getting it because you know i was at another one of the schools that i serve and it's like i look at their data and kids are like they're coming in at 81 percent 83 percent proficiency in reading Black kids are coming in high at 70 some percent proficiency in reading. And I go to another school that I serve and it's not that way. But then when I look at the difference, the kids who are at this other school had access to tutoring. They had access to, you know, all of these supports during our time away because of the pandemic. And the data we are capturing is that those kids are doing much better, right? But those kids who are in places where they did not have access to those supports, where, you know, they weren't, they weren't getting the same kind of, uh, you know, small group supports during the, you know, time away. Those kids are, those kids are further behind and these gaps are widening. So a lot of great stuff going on, um, but we have to, again, make sure it's to scale because it's still happening in the pockets of, of affluence, you know? So yeah, Riley, I, I want you to brag about what you're doing. No, you're good. And, uh, for those of you that weren't on at the very beginning, I was saying, I was telling my husband that I'm in the kitchen area. So I was just telling him that I'm on with all of you. Um, so sorry about that, uh, but that's working from home. Um, so yeah, and and for better and for worse, I think at a big policy systems macro level, um, which in some ways is uh, great. In, in other ways, it feels really distant from kids. So I like that 
Vernon, all of the examples you're giving are very tangible and impacting the lives of kids. Um, Cause I think it's easy in a weird way to lose sight of that. Um, from my vantage point, some of the things I get excited about, um, I am, uh, what I was just mentioning around that investment program, I am um, supporting uh, work for this ballot measure that's coming forward this year that'll be on the November ballot. And it's, uh, the acronym is LEAP, it's Learning Enrichment for Academic Progress, but it's about how do we get a sustainable state fund for families and primarily low-income families to access out-of-school learning um, and out-of-school experiences because we know it's bigger than just a school day. Um, that it's in some ways politically controversial. In other ways, it just makes sense to me in uh, how do we support what kids and families actually need. Um, so that's exciting. I mentioned the family school partnership work that I do. I get really excited. I, it's not a place that there's as much investment and energy around, but to the degree that we can fundamentally shift the way that schools and families connect with one another, I think you can see incredible change. Um, and, and that's going to be at the individual child level and the classroom and the school level. Um, but families have to know what's going on. They have to feel welcome. Children have to have a sense of belonging. And I don't know how you do that. Um, if schools don't invite the family in as a part of the learning that has to happen. Um, so I get excited about advancing research based family partnership work. Um, school finance, there's movement. It's hard. I've spent, I spent many years um, before graduate school now, like 10 years ago, working on school finance. We're still working on it. Um, but I do think there is an opportunity for real change there. So, um, and innovation, I think capital I innovation, the work that Vernon is doing, um, advancing in an innovation zone in Denver, and then lowercase i, what, where are we going? How do we say, all right, we've made progress in education. We have so much more to do. Where is there space for that? And how do we have conversations about what the future of education can look like? And how is that supported through um, state investment and policy? Um, so those are some of the like areas that I'm drawn to from more of a policy lens. You can't miss what Riley said. I don't think anybody should miss that we've had our teams what did you learn from COVID, right what what shifts did you make in your delivery of education that actually are better for kids right we have to capture those things and we can't be afraid to make those things new practice right we can't be afraid to say okay there are some kids who are thri who were thriving they one of the schools that i support the kids like did so much better on remote. And I'm thinking like, should we bring them back? Cause they were doing great, right? And you have to, you have to think about that. And you got to think about, you know, the, the box is the box and it wasn't serving everybody well. And so let's break open the box and begin to, again, practice equity and ask people, what are your needs? How can we meet them? What are your, what's your vision? How can we help you get there versus imposing our pathway and imposing our strategies on people when we can just show up and serve people and help them get to where they need to get to. And so I think hearing Riley's point, and I think what we do as a team is what did we learn? Like, yeah, there's a lot of tragedy because of COVID. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of grief, but there were also a lot of learnings. There are a lot of things that we learned about ourselves, about our kids, um, about technology. I mean, we got people who are fluent in Google Meet and and Microsoft Teams and Zoom that they never would have been, you know, fluent on these things. And now you got teachers, man, I watch some teachers who are like, boom, 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 I got groups over here and I'm doing, you know, breakout rooms this way. And it's like, oh my goodness, right? So are we just gonna throw that away? Or are we gonna say, there's another method, another pathway, another tool that we can use to meet people where they are to ensure that they're served equitably. Fluent in Zoom, except we all forget to take ourselves off mute half the time. <laughs> um, it, Vernon, maybe last question for you before um, we go to our audience questions. 
you know, Riley mentioned school finance. She mentioned out of school funding um, through the LEAP effort. I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about from your vantage point, um, you know, in an implementation space, how does school funding help hinder further, not further the efforts that, that you're trying to implement in the innovation space? Yeah, that's a lot. Like, I we could do a whole <laughs> in two I minutes. Mean, let me, yeah, let me, yeah, let me, uh, yeah, let me give a succinct answer. Um, if you go, if you go to Canes, you go to any fast food place, you're gonna, you're gonna put your order in, and when you get to the window, they are not gonna just hand you your food. They're gonna say, hey, if you want this outcome, you need to pay for the outcome, right? And so I think. I relate that, use that analogy because it's lunchtime. Um, but I think that's what we have to understand is that like the money that we put into the system and, and let me say intentionally put into the system, right? Because I think sometimes we can throw money again and do cosmetic things that get rid of the top of the weed, but not the root, right? But I think intentional dollars and intentional dollars for me, going back to what Riley said about innovation, intentional dollars are those dollars that principals, teachers, students, and families who are closest to the work say we need those dollars to get the work done, right? Not just random dollars that, that purchase things that are not needed or create positions that are not needed, but intentional dollars where how they are spent, how they are used are within the hands of those who are closest to the work. That's why what Riley was talking about is like, look, if we put this in the hands of families and families can then access after school tutoring, after school programming, all of these different kinds of things versus us saying, hey, we're gonna set up after school programming, hope you come. It, it's more empowering when those dollars are intentionally given and allowed to be um, distributed or spent in ways that a school campus actually needs versus just random, hey, you get a new whatever. And they're like, well, I could have used a social worker. Right. Um, those those are the things that we need to be. We need to when it comes to the financial piece, we need to. School sites need to have more freedom to determine this is what we need to do with our dollars. Riley's working hard to make sure the school finance formula is more uh, equitable and just for us. So we're, we're counting on Riley to get that work done. It's no pressure. But once that happens, I think that we will also see, you know, some of the root problem because that's at the root, right? Um, when you know that certain schools have the ability to, you know, you give them their, their per pupil allocation, but then they can go above and beyond that per pupil allocation because of the capacity that they have to raise additional dollars and not everybody has that capacity, then, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta fix some things. And so that's Riley's job. So we're kind of right. There's a question that builds perfectly on that um, from our audience. Um, says Vernon, you talked about addressing the roots rather than the fruits, just as you just did. Um, as, as philanthropists, how do we get to the roots? How, how does philanthropy get there? Riley, you want to take that first or is that for me? It's, it's for either of you. Um, I mean, it's I, it's a complicated question because philanthropy is complicated. Um, I would say from the specifics of, of who's on this call, um, as individuals that invest in this change, you have a level of autonomy that doesn't always exist at the foundation level. Um, and I think that you have an opportunity to say, I like these, the investment, these dollars, this needs to go um, to systemic issues this needs to go towards real bold and big change and there's a lot of people and it's there's a there's i know why like you can get sucked into doing more tweaking around the edges and adjustment work um and not saying is this really working if we know that literacy is important in 2012 we redid the read act we said we're gonna figure out how to build out early literacy we're gonna you know do this did it work did it not like where are we at with that and how can i use the money that i'm investing into this work to have a pointed conversation on something that's so important um and so i would say specific to 
philanthropy and getting to the roots in this audience. You guys have um, a different way to leverage your resources than than we see with some other foundations. Yeah, fund the uncomfortable, right? This is this is the you know we can continue to fund as we've been funding. Um, and there's some good stuff that you should continue to fund. So please hear this well. There's some good stuff you should continue to fund. But there's some stuff that you know that has just been gradualism, incrementalism, cosmetic stuff. That's not you, right? Um, I think we were talking before, fund the world that you want. And if the world that we want is equitable, if the world that we want is just, if the world that we want has every kid graduating from high school, ready for the choice of college or going into civic service or starting their own business. If that's the world that we want, then we've got to start funding those things. We've got to start funding those things in a way that ensures that it happens for every child, right? And so that is not one foundation. That's not one donor advised fund. That's all of us working together to move those dollars to that shared that desired reality. And so we talk a lot in our team about current reality, desired reality. I think we need to get a clear picture of what our desired reality is and then shift everything we're doing to get us there, right? And once you get that clear desired reality, we move. Yeah, yeah. that's an inspiring vision from both of you about what's possible. So a very specific question, um, but big answer. Um, this is specific to DPS, um, but I think could be um, expanded to many school districts. Um, and the question is, how can DPS and community groups prioritize providing permanent supportive housing to the increasing numbers of DPS students and their parents who are experiencing homelessness, knowing that that drives huge, um, huge disparity um, in the way that we're talking about? So again, how can DPS, the school district, provide yeah, permanent housing, right? How can they be a part of it? They have to demand that everybody who's in housing uh, creates a landscape where the families that we serve can live in the communities in which they go to school and can do so in a way that is affordable, that does not cause disruption where we're constantly seeing kids you know, in and out, right? I think there's a lot of things we lay at the feet of the district and those things really need to be laid at the feet of community planning. Those need to be laid at the feet of the mayor's office. Those need to be laid at, right? Again, we gotta get out of the silo. We gotta get out of the silo and start to understand that if we want a great city for our kids, it requires all of us moving in the same direction. And the reason why we keep putting feet, things at the feet of the district mm -hmm. is because again, I go back to that desired reality. What is the desired reality that we have as a city for our kids? And if we clearly paint that picture and all systems start to move in that direction, then you're gonna deal with the housing problem that uh, is there because that's not congruent with your desired reality. But right now, you know, oh, they let the district deal with that. Well, we got our, they, they got their hands full. We do, right? And, and, and so I, I think we can, we definitely, yeah, all hands on deck. That's what I'm going to say. All hands on deck with that. Yeah, I mean, I my immediate thought went to partnerships. Like it is yeah. that's an intentional partnership between the district and the city. And um, one of the people on this call, not myself, is potential is running for school board. You have to have people that are on that make up the DPS school board that have a holistic view and understanding of what it takes to care for kids and families and housing is is foundational to that and so while i think there are things that the district can do um they i remember having conversations years ago about um loan programs for educators to get low cost loans and to be able to start buying because if they can't live in denver if they can't be a part of the community in which they're serving um, there's problems there too. And so there's things where, where DPS can lead on, but I think it is an intentional partnership with the city. Um, and you've got to have leaders that look at the needs of kids and families first and foremost, and, um, and then holistically. 
Great. Well, well, we have a group with us that's really hungry to talk money. Um, so coming back around, um, wanting to know specifically um, what gaps in funding could be filled by philanthropy. So if you're looking oh. at the broad range of funding gaps where philanthropy is not infinite, right? Like there's a certain amount of dollars that exists there. Where is the best place for, for folks to plug in? Yeah, I'm sure Bradley has some great spaces. I'm going to go back to my desired reality because I think we can continue to give you these one-off answers and say, fund this, fund this, fund this, and still not get to where we want to go to, right? So there are, there are funding gaps, definitely. But I think we also need to fund some time for us to really create that desired reality and then begin to move that way with our dollars, right? So um, to Riley's point, the reason why legislation like LEAP comes forward is because there is definitely a funding gap when it comes to parents being able to access, all parents being able to access quality wraparound supports, right? The beyond school hour supports that all kids need. That definitely is a funding gap, right? Um, yeah, so I mean that's one example, but I'm still saying I'm gonna I'm gonna lean back on my whole. We gotta create a desired reality, folks, or we're gonna just continue to piecemeal, and none of those pieces are gonna get us to where I think we all want to go. That's great. Thanks, Vernon. Riley, what about you? I mean, I would just say you get really clear when we think about funding of if your goal is funding within or outside of the system, and to what Vernon was just saying, there's a lot of needs outside of the system. Um, most obvious to me is early childhood. The foundation that we put for our kids, the financial burden for families to feel like their child is in a safe place. Um, and in addition to that, getting the foundational skills they need to enter school ready. I mean, that is, it, it's terrifying. Uh, and as someone that's paying for um, high quality childcare for a 15 month old, it's really expensive. Um, and that's outside of the system. We haven't figured that out um, comprehensively. I mean, we grade and blend funding from the feds and we try to, um, we've got DPP, we've got different things, but that's huge. Um, or the out of school learning stuff. Those are things that are outside of the K-12 system. Um, and, and so I think it's direct investments there to improve because the system is just not cutting it and not, not there. My bias um, is if you want to fund the K-12 system, push for equitable funding within the K-12 system. You can go in and infuse dollars through, um, you know, DPS foundation, like district foundation, stuff like that. And that's wonderful, but it's absolutely insane and disgusting <laughs> that we have such an inequitable funding system. So the way that the, the School Finance Act operates, there's a base amount of funding that every child gets and then there's weights that sit on top of that and the weight the weights for things like district needs are so much heavier than individual child needs and so cost of living is the biggest factor it is um it is 60 percent of the base funding where at risk a child that is low income is only 12 percent in addition to the base funding that's insane to me. If we have a belief that all kids can learn, but it takes different investments for them to achieve that, use in your investments to push to say, I expect a school, like our state investments to be centered around equity and child need. And that would be a game changer because that's in perpetuity. That is a whole lot more money than any foundation or individual can give on an ongoing basis. And if we can shift that and create pressure around that, I think that has a last that has the potential to have a lasting impact. Great. Um, talk to us a little bit about what makes Denver's K-12 education landscape unique as compared to other cities and districts of our size. I think, I think what makes us unique is definitely, um, I, I'm gonna say Denver's portfolio of, of schools is definitely unique for us to be a, in, in a district where we have such variety, um, such um, different choices for parents. Uh, you've got charters, you've got 
innovation schools, you got innovation zone schools, you've got traditional neighborhood schools, you got magnet programs. As a parent of five kids, for me, that is great because five kids are all different learners, right? And they all have different spaces that they thrive in, uh, different communities that they find themselves um, identifying with. So I think the, to have such a broad offering um, in Denver is great. Um, I think the fact that we have a lot of uh, partnerships from our community, I mean, so many schools have strong PTAs, they have got foundation support, they've got, you know, business partners. I think we have pockets of, of like, man, if we could just get that all rocking the scale, we'd be in a great space. Um, and, I, and I think the Denver voters, I mean, people can't, you can't take that for granted that every time the DPS has gone for a bond lately, we've been supported by Denver voters. So um, we have to accept that that's not the case in a, in a lot of places. So there is a heart, right, for the kids. There is there is a there is a uh, desire to make sure that we have the best the best schools. And so I would say that our portfolio and then just you know diverse offerings and then our um, the support that we get from our community. Riley, any thoughts? Um, I think where Vernon went with it makes a lot of sense to me. I, the specific policies that have enabled that portfolio to operate are critical. I, um, Vernon knows this well. I was on the board of a startup charter school in Aurora, and it didn't end up making it. And largely that was because their facility, they, they had to pay for that. And the fact that Denver has shared their facilities and has done something different um, historically around that is a game changer in terms of being able to offer different options to kids. I will say the Denver space is, is evolving. And it's not that 10 years ago, everything was right and now everything is wrong, but at least I feel like there's a little bit of an identity crisis right now in Denver. Um, and where do we go and what is the next chapter in our book of, of how we improve and do right by kids here? Um, it's, it's not totally clear. And so I think also to people that are engaged in the Denver space, pushing people that are uh, working in education, working at the district, running for school board, do, on the school board saying, what is your vision? Where, you know, what does it look like to achieve that vision and asking that question? Because I think we're at an inflection point in that conversation and, um, and the more people that are kind of asking that and pushing, I think the better. So this last right question. Right. Yeah, and, right, that was great. I just wanted to say that was great. <laughs> and um, this is, I think, one that's um, a little more personal to each of you. Um, this is clearly challenging work. What is it that keeps you motivated to do it every day? Mm. <sighs> it is. It is challenging work. It is, and there there are hard days, um, because we're we're we are not just at a space in education. I think we are as a space as human beings that there's those of us who want to be better towards each other and then there are still those skeletons there are still those things that that hinder that right there are still those things that we're trying to push through that uh, i don't know it's my optimism I, I mean i'm at an elementary school today and those kids man they they keep you going they 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 don't see the world like we see it because they don't know it right their smiles their laughter their you know everybody playing with each other on the playground it makes you say god why can't we be like that like what causes us you know when we get to be adults to begin to just do what we do so for me it's every day getting up and knowing that what we do can make the world that these kids believe in actually the world that they're going to live in, right? Because they believe in a much better world than they know, right? And so I, what gets me going every day is to say, like, we have the opportunity that when this six-year-old becomes an 18-year-old who steps out of the comfort of his 
household, the world is actually as he, he imagined it from his first day on the kindergarten playground, right? That to me is like what keeps me going every day is to say that's the world we need to fight for. And you have great friends like Riley who when it gets hard, you can text and you can lean on and you can say it's hard, you know, that's that's real. You gotta, you gotta be able to have folks like that. You can say, I almost quit today, right? Or um, my heart is heavy today, you know? So linking up in the ecosystem, knowing that you're not in it alone, knowing that you have other folks in very different sectors uh, helps you keep going. Yeah, that's beautiful. Riley? Yeah, I would, I just agree with what Vernon said. I appreciate this question. And I'll also be really honest. I struggle in this work. Um, and the longer I've been in it, the more I struggle. Like I was, I was saying at a breakfast meeting this morning, I, I kind of miss the Riley 15 years ago that was like really excited to go to the school finance interim committee because look at the change. And now it's been 10 school finance interim committees with minimal to no change. And it's hard to not get jaded um, and to feel down. Like, can we change this from a systems level? Um, and I think it is, it's humans, it's the relationships. I mean, Vernon's saying that that's actually very real. I feel an obligation to show up for him and he does for me and, and also for kids, but what I see more is Vernon than I see kids. So um, that's real. And I think the other thing is that grounds me around this work is every challenge that I see, like many of you, I'm, I'm a political nerd and I think about the problems and the challenges in front of our state and our country and the world. And so it all comes back to education. You know, are we critical thinkers? Are we, do we have the skill sets we need to tackle big challenges? Can we restore democracy and have people work with one another? Um, and I, it always comes back to education to me. So then I just feel like we well, can't walk away from that. Um, and that is motivating. Thank you. Thanks to both of you uh, for being with us today. This was a really enlightening conversation. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And to all of you who have joined us for this session, thanks to you as well. Um, your passion and your interest are the things that keep us going um, and make us feel inspired to do this work every day. So thank you, have a great afternoon and we'll see you all next time.